This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Episode 18. This week, Major Trevor Boswell, our first U.S. Air Force guest, joins us to discuss the munitions fighter pilots employ to down another aircraft. That's right, we're talking air-to-air weapons. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and, most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello, everyone. This is Vincent Aiello. Welcome to another episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Today, as you just heard, we are talking air-to-air weapons with our first U.S. Air Force guest. And this just seemed like a logical follow-on to our previous interview with Mongo back in episode 17 on his Desert Storm MiG kill. And in fact, on episode 19, we are going to have an interview on air-to-surface weapons. So we got a little three-part miniseries going here for you. Hope everybody's doing great. I am totally excited about this podcast and the show itself. As you know, we've got Jaime Lopez making our intro and outro music for us now. And we're going to do one new song every month, similar to the background pictures that you find on our social media, because that way he can help us out but not be overly taxed with it. And then we'll just change the comms or try to mix it up a little bit if we can. Also, we've got folks helping out in different ways. I've got a guy helping me now with YouTube. I've got a fellow in Australia offering to help reboot the website, so you should see that hopefully in the next month or two. And it's just been a real incredible journey to receive all the positive feedback on this show. As I've said before, I enjoy doing it anyway, but your response, your feedback, your support has just made it really so worthwhile and so enjoyable. So I just want to thank everybody for that. In fact, I want to tell you about Brian, who runs Call the Ball Simulators in La Mirada, Southern California. He reached out to me and had me come out and check out his simulator. He's got it in a small office there, not far from Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm. And he actually makes a little bit of a side living doing this. He rents it out to people. They can buy it through his website and come check it out. It's a virtual reality system where you put a headset on and sit in a mock-up of a cockpit. And he can have you go out and fly around San Diego or land on the carrier. And it's a lot of fun. I tell you, I tried it out. It's almost as good as the multi-million dollar simulators that I used to use in my training for the Navy. So I want to tell you about calltheballsimulators.com. If you go to that website, we'll have a link in the show notes. And if you are in the area and you want to go check it out, he has a special promotion for our listeners. So if you log in to his website and book a trip for you and or someone else, then if you put in the code FPP, as in Fighter Pilot Podcast, but if you put in FPP18, then he will give you a discount on the next time you're in that area and you want to go check out his simulator. So check out Call the Ball Simulators in La Mirada, Southern California. All right, well, we have some listener questions to get to today, and we're going to start with Alex. Not sure where he's from, but Alex asks, How was the 2005 cruise? I worked on a Navy watch floor and heard plenty of stories firsthand about how difficult half a year on the ship can be, mainly from guys who didn't get to leave in a flight suit every once in a while. Just curious if you have any interesting stories that center around your time spent living with the cameras. So what Alex is alluding to here is in 2005 on USS Nimitz, that is when the PBS film crew came out and filmed that eight or so part series called Carrier. And many of you have sent me the link where I have a short cameo on the Pitching Deck episode. And in fact, I had just landed after a particularly heinous night landing, well, attempted night landing, where the deck was moving quite a bit. I think I've talked about this on other episodes or other interviews, perhaps. And, you know, they were out there and and interviewed me right as I landed when really I just was happy to be alive and wanted to be left alone. But to your question, Alex, you know, that was for me one of my best deployments for several reasons. Number one, I was a department head, so I was pretty proficient. I was in a leadership position 
in the squadron and was just surrounded by a lot of good guys and gals in the squadron and the air wing. And we went to a lot of different fun port visits. I think if I remember correctly, roughly in order, it was Hawaii, Hong Kong, Guam, Kuala Lumpur, Bahrain, Dubai, Singapore on the way home, and I think Hawaii again. Actually, we went to Perth on that one as well. So I, if I recall correctly, on that one deployment, we went to as many different ports as I did on all my previous deployments combined. And to your question, though, having the PBS guys out there, you know, some people really liked it, some didn't. For me, it was just kind of a nuisance because they would make us do certain things certain way so that it would look good on their filming. And we just, for the most part, at least I wanted to just be left alone. Some people love the camera, and if you watch the series, you'll see who they are. But for the rest of us, we just dealt with it because just like everything else out there, you put up with the things that, you know, irritate you, which is funny because certain things irritate you when you're on deployment that might not otherwise. But for the most part, it was not that big a deal. But it was a good deployment. We spent some of it in the Persian Gulf. And if I remember correctly, I think that was one of the few where we brought everyone home, which is not always the case. Anyway, thanks for your question, Alex. All right, next up, let's take a phone call. My name is Dustin. I'm calling from Hawaii. So I'm catching up on your show. And I just listened to the two episodes about the carrier ops. And I had a question about you know, with 5,000 people on a ship, how often do you run into people that you recognize? Or is it kind of like uh, being in a big city where you're constantly bumping into people you don't even recognize? Or do you kind of gain a, an eye for people as you know them? And uh, maybe uh, another question I was thinking about is, obviously, with a bunch of 19-year-olds, some inappropriate relationships probably crop up. But how is that handled in the Navy in general? Uh, anyway, I really love the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for the phone call, Dustin. So the first part of your question, you actually are correct on both accounts. I mean, within the air wing, you get to know everybody pretty well because you fly together, you brief, debrief together, and in port, you generally hang out and party together. But if you go to a different part of the ship, down to medical or one of the supply rooms or mechanic rooms, you might see people you vaguely recognize, depending on what your job is. If you're the squadron CEO, of course, you should know everybody in your squadron. But if you are just going somewhere in some obscure space on the ship, maybe way down deep where the folks are working on the shafts or the screws for the ship or something, then you're not going to recognize any of them. So you're constantly seeing people you know, and you're constantly seeing people you don't know. And with 5,000 people, it's not uncommon to see someone for the first time towards the end of a six-month deployment. Regarding your second question, this might be one I should save for a former commanding officer as I was never in that capacity. But as I understand it, personal relationships are generally frowned upon. On the other hand, leadership knows that it cannot be avoided for the reason you stated. You get 18, 19, 20-year-old young men and women out there full of testosterone away from home, and it's going to happen. So we try to make sure it does not impact anyone's work. And if people work for each other, we try to split them up. And if it really becomes an issue, it can turn into counseling or even reassignment for someone. So it's not uncommon. We try to deal with it best we can. And if it becomes a burden to good order and discipline, then there is counseling at a minimum and possibly reassignment. All right, next, a question from Duncan. Not sure where Duncan is from. He says, many people are worried about drones doing damage to the civilian populace. And, quote, drones have become a negative term. But I always thought that drones would just supplement the jobs currently done by manned aircraft like in your FA-18. Is there something about drones that make them less accurate than a manned aircraft? Is a, quote, fear of drones at all justified? Well, Duncan, appreciate the question. I'm going to answer this from a military aviation perspective. Regarding drones, as you put it, I mean, gosh, if you watch the Terminator movies, I suppose we should be fearful for Skynet or whatever is going to take over and eradicate the human race. But I don't know. I can't tell you whether you should be fearful of something or not. Is it a question of safety? Is it a question of it taking away your jobs? I think in the military, drones serve a very good purpose for reasons we've talked about elsewhere on this show. And I don't think there's any reason to fear them in that regard. And is there something about drones that make them less accurate than a manned aircraft? Well, possibly. The fact that whoever is controlling the aircraft is not in it and does not have the full situational awareness that that pilot might have if he or she was in it. That's certainly one thing. But on the other hand, if it's flying via the automated systems and the computers, 
it's quite possible that it actually could be more effective or more accurate than a human. So it's a tough question you pose, Duncan. I'm not sure how to better answer it than that. Personally, no, I'm not fearful of them in a military sense, and I don't think there's any reason to be. All right, next up, Simon from Newcastle in the United Kingdom asks, did you or your fellow pilots ever get the chance to train with foreign allied aviators? Specific tactics and capabilities aside, did you find you were able to exchange useful information? Well, yes, indeed, Simon. Many of us have a chance to go do different things with different countries. I, for one, have seen many Australians and folks from the UK that have come to the United States and served as exchange pilots. Uh, But my personal experience, I was able to participate in Frisian flag. That is an exercise held in the Netherlands by the Dutch Air Force. And for a week, I was able to get off the carrier John F. Kennedy and fly up there with a good friend of mine. And we performed daily operations with the Dutch and many others. And I would say we are all cut from the same cloth us fighter pilots. We might have different accents and we might come from different places and have different names, but for the most part, we all work hard and party hard and we all try to be our best when we're flying. And and I really enjoyed my time there with the Dutch. And then on that very same deployment, I had a chance to participate in Bright Star, which is an Egyptian exercise. And in fact, I was able to spend some time on the ground in Egypt and met some of those pilots. And there again, I think we're all just very similar in our bent and our desire to get things done and be responsible and and control the aircraft and just, you know, just do the things that fighter pilots do. So I would say the world over, we are pretty much the same types of people. Again, all cut from that same cloth. All right. Well, once again, this week, we have a relatively long episode. I tried to trim it the best I could, but I've heard from many of you that you prefer the longer episodes. So it's actually less work for me to just leave it that way. So we are going to jump into this interview with Boat. Now, I will tell you, if you hear a little bit of weird sounds at times, it's our microphones jostling. We were sitting in a hotel room and it's not your sound system. Don't be fearful that something weird is going on. It's just us doing our best with the microphones. At any rate, let's get straight to the interview here, and I'll come back at the end and explain a few more things for you. All right, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is coming to you from Salt Lake City, Utah today, and joining me is our first U.S. Air Force guest. We have Major Trevor Boswell on the show. Boat, welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me. You betcha. Well, I'm glad you reached out. You found out about this show and sent me an email, and we were able to connect Today, we're going to talk about air-to-air weapons. Absolutely. And you know something about that because what do you fly or used to fly? Uh, F-16s, commonly known as the uh, Fighting Falcon, uh, more affectionately the Viper. Okay. Now, before we jump into that, let's talk a little bit about you. You've heard the show. You know how this goes. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you've been, and where you are now. Absolutely, yeah. So I'm originally from Colorado, grew up there, Uh, went to the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, My dad was uh, a Navy pilot. He flew A-6s. My uh, grandfather before him was a B-24 pilot in uh, World War II, so that's what kind of got my interest in aviation peaked and uh, eventually went through the ROTC program there and uh, found my way into the Air Force against my dad's wishes. Okay. Yeah, because his dad was Army Air Corps, and he was Navy, so now we've got all three. That's right. Okay. And let's see. So you went through flight school. You picked up what? Uh, so I went to uh, Euronado Joint Jet Piling at Shepard Air Force Base, uh, and uh, that was uh, basically an automatic straight shot to fighter pilots or bombers, and uh, ended up getting an F-16 out of there, went to uh, Fighter F RTU at uh, Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, and then from there went to my first operational assignment in uh, Misawa Air Base, Japan, flying the Block 50, and then from there I was an aggressor up at Eielson Air Force Base flying the Block 30, and then I returned to Luke as an instructor pilot teaching the next generation of fighter pilots. Very cool. So did you end up here at uh, Hill Air Force Base? Yep. So I finished uh, my active duty time down there at Luke and then uh, transitioned to the Air Force Reserves and began my uh, reserve career at flying F-16s and then subsequently transitioning to uh, civilian sector, flying commercially for a major airline. Okay. Excellent. So this is a relatively delicate subject, as we talked about before we started rolling tape. And what we're going to talk about today, just to keep it simple and to set the stage for everyone, Boat, is... The hardware itself, the weapons, how they operate, how we give them the information to do what they need to do. But we're going to skip any of the tactics because that is, I think, a dangerous slope for us, knowing things that we do and 
we don't want to disclose anything we shouldn't. So let's talk about air-to-air weapons. And I thought it might be fun to just talk about if the you and I, in your former adversary capacity, were heading towards each other and we were going to shoot each other. Let's just think of this chronologically. So the longest range weapon we would shoot first. And so in our current inventory, what are we looking at for that? Right now, we're looking at the AIM-120, the AMRAM, the Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air Missile. That is a uh, fully active, uh, capable missile, meaning that it has its own internal radar that's able to lock onto a target and then track itself all the way to uh, impact. Uh, that thing is uh, looking long range down track, as we call it. So, uh, you know, anywhere without talking to specific ranges here beyond visual range. And so uh, we're looking to hopefully get a shot off the missile rail of the aircraft uh, down to a target down track using the host aircraft radar and then from that uh, communication between the aircraft and the missile, uh, it's able to then find the target aircraft, and then it passes that coordinate data off to where that target is, how fast it's going, the direction of travel, uh, that kind of information. And from there, that missile is then going to find it, lock onto it with its own radar internally, and then track that thing all the way into impact. Okay. So right now, this is our, for our teen fighters in the U.S. inventory, this is our longest range weapon, even though we call it a medium, advanced medium range air-to-air missile. And it has the ability, as you're saying, to get some cueing from the aircraft, the host aircraft, but then has its own seeker to find the target, right? So exactly right. So when I squeeze the trigger, I'm giving it a quick data dump of, here's where I want you to go in space and time, really. Exactly. And when you get there, I want you to look for something that meets these parameters. Now, while it's flying, is it getting any sort of updates? So yeah, so as long as your host aircraft radar is providing queuing to where that target is, because obviously we're not just sitting there stationary in space, that target is traveling a distance over time in terms of a speed, an altitude change, or a direction change, that kind of uh, information is being then provided via data link to the missile, providing updates to it. So as that missile is traveling through the air, it is updating its trajectory to find the most optimal intercept and hopefully reach that target as quickly as possible. And then there comes a point when the missile will actually take over and then the host aircraft is no longer required. Correct, yeah. So there is that transition phase where the host aircraft is continuing to provide updates via data link to the missile. It can choose whether it would like to continue to receive that information or not based off of the type of target, the type of information that's being passed, et cetera. And then at that point, it will then provide its own guidance via its own radar once it's locked onto the target that it was anticipating locking onto uh, all the way to intercept. Okay. And we jumped right into this, actually. So when did this thing first become operational? So this missile is probably the most recent of the radar missiles to have been developed. Uh, Specifically, uh, this was developed in the late 70s, early 80s. It was fielded uh, on the F-15 initially, but wasn't actually used in combat until Desert Storm, uh, so the early 90s. Which is pretty pathetic when you think about our quote-unquote newest missile is 27 years old. Well, in theory, yeah. So obviously... Every piece of technology goes through changes and iterations. So this is now the A variant of this In the early missile. 90s. Uh, in, the, in the early 90s, right. exactly. And this is all based off of very early computer technology. So you're thinking Apple IIe computers, those types of things. Very small processor capability, that kind of uh, technology very early on in computer. So not a lot of processing power. And then you take the next step up and you go to the AIM-120B and subsequently the C and then there's some inner variants of the C model, uh, the three, five, six, and seven. Uh, and some of those are computer technology changes, and some of those are uh, the motor that's propulsing. So in other words, the missile continually improves as technology improves, or the military asks for increased benefits, electronic protection. Absolutely. Software updates, warhead updates, motor updates. Uh, exactly. In fact, from the A to the B, they even trimmed the fins a little bit. I believe that was what, to fit it internally or something, right? So there was some discussion about that, yep. So there was obviously, they needed to make sure that it fit internally into the F-20 as that started its design phase. And then obviously for its own aerodynamic purposes, if they didn't need the extra weight or the extra drag, then obviously let's get rid of that to make that as efficient as possible. Okay. All right. And so this thing has been proven in combat. About how big is it? Yeah. So the AIM-120, relatively speaking, is around 330 pounds and it ends up being about 12 feet long. It's it's a pretty sizable weapon, especially when you're looking at it on an F-16 or an F-18. Right. Okay. And what would you say are some strengths and weaknesses of the AIM-120? 
Strengths, obviously, it has the uh, the length of travel that it's capable of uh, performing at. It can go out there and reach out and touch someone at a pretty long distance. Relatively speaking, that can be used all the way into the visual arena as well, and it does have very good within visual range capabilities. Electronic protection, it does a, a really good job at uh, you know defeating electronic attack uh, from foreign adversaries uh, that are trying to jam the missile uh, or prevent you from being able to see uh, the target once the missile has come off the rail. And as far as weaknesses are concerned, Every weapon has a weakness of some sort. This one, you know, specifically, it doesn't have the long range that the Phoenix in the past did. Uh, and so, obviously, without that longer range capability, now we, we do force our American air crews or uh, allied air crews into harm's way a little bit more than right. we like. Yeah, we just haven't had that capability since the Phoenix. And I would agree with that. I think I would add to the strengths is we can fire multiple AMRAM into multiple adversaries, uh, whereas the missile we're about to talk about, you can't do that. And you do have a fire and forget capability, like you said. And so I think those are good. Also, we can carry a lot of these. Now, theoretically, I've never seen this, but we can carry, I believe, 10 on a regular F-18. And you guys can carry them on the wingtips. How many can you guys carry on an F-16? Or how many have you ever carried you personally? I've only ever been in a in a two by two configuration. So, and we'll talk to the AIM nine here in a bit. But that would be two AIM one twenties and two AIM nines simultaneously. That's probably the the fewest number of AIM one twenties that I would ever carry. Typically, it would be a three by one loadout, three AIM one twenties and one AIM nine. However, the F sixteen can carry six uh, as long as the um, inner. Uh, Stations three and seven pylons are configured properly right. for that. F-15s have a large aircraft and therefore can carry more AIM-120s uh, and AIM-9s. Uh, and there are some discussions on uh, multiple racks that now carry uh, four versus just two. So just a wow. huge uh, exponential increase in just quantity of missiles being carried. That's crazy. Now, do you guys on the F-16 have the ability to fire this in a visual mode? We have that on the F-18. There is, yeah. That's the mad dog mode. Right. And basically, that's just, you know, the great white hope. Basically, you're just shooting it down there, hoping that the missile itself is going to be able to find what you're wanting it to find on its own. There's no queuing. There's no guidance. You just kind of shoot it and hope it goes. Right. So yeah. tactically speaking, it's not the best maneuver. But if you are in some sort of desperate straits, if you fire it in the visual mode, it comes off, it opens its eyes, and it basically, it's a rabid dog. It attacks the first thing it sees. Absolutely. And that could be, <laughs> you know, hopefully the enemy that you're going after or... Your poor wingman that somehow got in front of you, you know, hopefully it's uh, the former, not the latter. But, yeah. you know, an example of the, one of those situations where you might use that would be if your own radar on your aircraft was broken. So if it, you know, breaks for some, you know, reason whatsoever, and that's the last missile, that's probably one of those contingencies that you'd want to shoot that, sure. that way. Sure, sure. And I remember going back to your point about, you know, hopefully your wingman's not there, and I agree with that totally. But I remember someone once telling me at Top Gun, they said, look, if the guy behind me is definitely going to kill me, and your missile may or may not kill me, shoot the dang missile. Because, Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> because it could obviously help out. But tactically speaking, it's not something we do very often if we can help it. Absolutely, yeah. We, we call that clear avenue fire, I think, is kind of what you're alluding to there. And that's just making sure that the missile can discern the friendly from the foe. And that's just making sure that, you know, as the missile comes off the rail, that we've provided enough distance in whatever form that takes, either vertically or horizontally, to make sure that there is no way that the missile is going to be able to track the friend and it will only go for the foe. Okay. All right, well, let's move in then to the next weapon, which is the AIM-7 Sparrow. Now, I think before we were recording, you said you didn't have a lot of experience with this weapon. That is true. So, um, and in general, most... Air Force F-16 pilots probably have no experience at this point. Uh, so they just kind of phased it out. 10 to once... 15 years. Yeah, okay. they have not had any uh, exposure to AIM-7s uh, in, in any form or fashion. F-15 may have a different story on that one, but uh, for F-16 uh, side of the house, we don't. Yeah, well, I can probably fill in some of this because I was actually on the last deployment of the F-A-18A, which could not carry the AMRIM. We only had Sparrow, oh, wow. and that was in 2003, which to me still seems like fairly recently, but I realize <laughs> it's not. But with VFA-97 in Air Wing 11 at the time, we just realized if the balloon ever went up, as the expression goes, that we would either not be much in the air-to-air -air regime or, you know, it was just a big limitation. And so thankfully, they upgraded those aircraft uh, after that. Did the F-16 ever have Sparrow? Uh, it did. Okay. So it was. It is capable of flying it. We just don't tactically use them in any sort of 
situation okay. right now. I don't even think we have any in the inventory. Right. But, okay. But I'm not sure. So this thing became operational before Vietnam. Didn't have a particularly great reputation in Vietnam, unfortunately. And it has done better since the later variants, like the hotel and the mic. Sure. And I believe in Desert Storm, even though the Amram was showing up, as I understand it, it actually did get quite a few kills. Yeah, so it's definitely had its day in the sun, uh, if you will. Very similarly in size, uh, a little bit lighter, but uh, very similar in size overall to the AIM-120. It was kind of the predecessor to the AIM-120 as a semi-active radar guidance missile, meaning that it required the host radar of the aircraft to guide it to the target 100% of the time. So unlike the AMRAM where we can shoot it and eventually the missile will take over, this missile, the AIM-7 Sparrow, is going to require the radar to be locked on the target the entire time from the aircraft, which is a definitely a disadvantage uh, right. when it comes to uh, air-to-air employment. But yeah, it, it has a lot of uh, combat uh, history to it. For sure. But to your point, so let's just touch on that. So whereas the AMRAM can be told where to go, and when it gets there, opens its eyes and hopefully has the right queuing to look for the target. In the case of the Sparrow, in fact, at least on the F-18, we have to have some sort of tuning that goes on. And the radar has to detect the target, the radar on the aircraft, illuminate it with pulse Doppler illumination, and then pass, if you will, the code to the Sparrow to say, are you, are you seeing this? And it should be able to say, yes, it does. And then when it's fired, it homes in on that. So the big disadvantage, like you just said, is I and the aircraft have to continue to illuminate the target the entire time. Whereas in the AMRAM, there may come a point when the missile takes over, I can turn and run. Now I'm required to stay pointing at the threat and illuminate the target, which also means if the radar has a hiccup, that could be a problem. If the target maneuvers and breaks my radar lock, then the missile's going to go stupid. But if it's not seeing that reflected radar energy, it's not going to get to the target. Correct, yeah. So that would be kind of that continuous wave illuminator, uh, which is what the seeker of the missile is looking for. It's looking for that radar energy, that specific code, and it's just looking for basically the reflection off the aircraft that's being targeted uh, and looking to uh, strike that. So it's more of, in fact, it's only a receiver, whereas the AMRAM has a transmit and receive. Correct. The Sparrow is only receiving. Absolutely. Now, one advantage of that, though, is that if something is jamming it, it can just home in on that jammer. Yeah, so as long as the jammer is obviously repeating the same signal that your host radar uh, from your own airplane is providing, then, yeah, it's just going to home right on into it. So it's kind of, you know... It's an advantage to have a jammer, but it's a disadvantage if it's the exact same signal. So you have to balance out the two sure. there. True. Okay. So. And so Sparrow's already, like you said, pretty much out of the inventory. I think it's about gone for F-18s as well. I probably think. as well. Yeah, I don't think they're actually actively producing them. So probably the shelf life uh, right. is starting might to, just uh, to reach there. Shooting up the ones they've got left exactly. just for the fun of it. Uh, but I meant to ask you, did you ever actually shoot an AMRAM? I have shot an AMRAM, yeah. So I went down to uh, Eglin Air Force Base, and we did some test shots down cool. there. And everybody meets in the airspace, and there you have a, a few drones that they fire out in the air, and you go out there, and whatever their test profile is, you go shoot. So my test profile was a couple F-16s and, and a line of breast about a mile and a half apart, and everybody shooting at the same time and, and seeing what happens. <laughs> so uh, I think I shot a, a B variant, and my, my uh, wingman shot a C. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I never had a chance to shoot an AMRAM, but I shot a Sparrow. And again, it was on a decoy that someone had dropped, like a tactical air launch decoy or Taub. Yeah. And I, to this day, maintain that I did my part right. <laughs> but you can see where this is going because I, uh, I had the target illuminated, single target track, which again, getting back to capabilities, one of the disadvantages of this is, whereas with AMRAM, you can shoot more than one bad guy. With a Sparrow, you can only shoot one at a time. Yep. And I had everything I thought correct, and we looked at the tape later, and it did look like it. And I pulled the trigger, and I heard the whoosh and felt it come off, and I never saw anything in front of me, so I finally rolled upside down and looked, and the thing was heading down into the ocean, so that was kind of a bummer. Uh, it didn't quite work, and of course, when I got back to the ship, everyone blamed me for it, so I guess well, that's part of being a fighter pilot. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Yeah, All it right. seemed, seemed like a bottle rocket off the, my wingtip. So For sure. All right. Well, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Sparrow? Well, sure. So, you know, like we said, the strengths there, uh, it's looking for a specific signal and it's uh, wanting to find that signal. So it's just going to go after it. Um, the protection from electronic attack is, is probably a little bit higher, um, relatively speaking, than uh, it trying to find its own way. And uh, the, the chance to spoof it or fake it out uh, is probably a little bit lower. Again, 
not to get into the classified realm, but again, a huge for the time for the technology level, a huge you know advantage that uh, we were able to take uh, utilizing the radar there. Weaknesses wise, again, like we discussed, single target track, so you're only able to go after one target at a time, and you're having to put yourself in harm's way uh, in terms of distance quite a bit more than you would with the AMRAM. Right. Plus, I guess they're also older, so maybe not as reliable, perhaps. But again, this isn't something that's going to be employed day one of a big shooting war. Correct, yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Fair enough. All right, so in our earlier scenario, you and I are heading at each other, and we're shooting, let's say, these air-to-air weapons from the greatest range until we get closer. Now, as we get into that visual arena, we have the AIM-9 Sidewinder. So talk to us about that. Okay, so the AIM-9 Sidewinder, that is probably the oldest air-to-air weapon outside of the gun that we still currently employ. This was uh, initially designed in the 50s and has, again, made technological leaps along the way, most of which we have retained, some of which have been has been stolen and uh, has been proliferated across the world. Okay. To your point, I, I don't know if it's true, but I was told that the Soviets at one point got their hands on one of these. I don't know if it was in Germany. And turned it into, like, their yeah. own variant or something. Yeah, so they... they uh, as, as happens, you know, intelligence is uh, being collected all the time around the world. The Chinese got a hold of one because during, I believe it was the Vietnam War, one hit an aircraft, got stuck in the aircraft, but did not explode. And that, that airplane went all the way home and landed. And boom, they had an AIM-9. <laughs> and it was just sitting there. Too bad. Uh, um, so boom, there you go. So there, that's, you know, that's one way of collecting intel. Others is stealing it. And others is uh, just going after the technology, right. the designs of it, and then make, you know, basically building your own. Uh, back home. So this is a smaller weapon than the others, right? It's only Correct. not even 300 pounds, I believe. Yeah, it's uh, just under 200 pounds. Uh, under 200, just, okay. Yeah, and just just short of 10 feet long. So that seems like it's pretty darn long and skinny, which it actually is. And I think it gets its name because the profile it flies looks like a sidewinder snake. And The original ones. Okay. Uh, now they've refined that because that is a very inefficient flight profile. Um, okay. But uh, the original ones based off of the tracking type that it used uh, to find the target that's what it looked like. It looked like a corkscrew or a sidewinder snake. Sure. Yep. And so you said that this tracks on the infrared energy or heat. Let's just make it simple if sure. we want. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, this, by definition, is not a particularly long-range weapon. I mean, it needs to be cued onto heat by the host aircraft, and then we need to some feedback that, in fact, it sees that. And anyone who's watched Top Gun has heard the little tones and seen all sure. that. absolutely. And then so once we know that, then we can pull the trigger and usually that ends up in the visual arena that's correct yeah so primarily it's a visual uh, weapon you're meaning that you can see with your eyeballs the guy that you're trying to shoot that being said technological advances being what they are we have a radar and the, the technological advantage of computers helps us now to basically put the same type of uh, processing into an ir weapon like this one the aim nine where we can put a point out in space where a target is and have the missile shoot to that, open its eyes, and hopefully find what it is looking for. Maybe. So instead of the AMRAM using its eyes as in the transmitter of the radar, it's going to open its IR eyes and look for a signature. That's interesting. Absolutely, okay. yeah. And, and then also the types of materials that we are using as the seeker to find the heat source, uh, as you refer to it, um, those are now that much better that they are able to discriminate between the aircraft and then the environment around it uh, and hopefully at a longer range be able to pick that thing up to track it itself. Right. So if you're shooting a sidewinder downhill, if you will, at an aircraft with a hot desert background, it could be hard for that missile to discern what is the target and what is just that cluttered environment. Yeah, absolutely. And so you kind of led into the how do you do that? Uh, and without getting too technical, uh, you have to have kind of a starting point to come f- to, to go off of. And so the missiles themselves don't have a, a database of this is what this airplane will produce at this temperature or anything like that. It's taken that snapshot in time of, of how hot that aircraft is, how hot the environment is, and whatever the queuing source uh, that is providing that initial, you know, hey, go look at this thing. Uh, to the missile. So in this case, if you're looking at an airplane, you know, going across your nose from left to right, and you're looking down, so i.e. you're staring at the ground, then you have to be able to, to let that missile have enough time to find the heat source based off of the radar track that you're queuing it with. And now it should hopefully be able to lock onto it. And those are the tones you kind of referred to. Certain tones mean 
good track. Certain tones mean maybe I'll find it, and then other tra other tones mean they don't see it whatsoever. And there are visual cues as well in the HUD or the joint uh, helmet mounted cueing system that can give you that um, you know positive response that you're looking for that the missile does actually see what you're trying to get it to see. Right now in Vietnam with early variants of the Sidewinder, the shooting aircraft had to be almost directly behind the target aircraft to see up its tailpipe, if you will. Correct. Is that still the case today? No. So the missiles have gone from a purely rear aspect, which is what you were talking about, mm -hmm. to an all aspect capable weapon. So that, that means that, you know, you're pointing at each other. It can see the heat source or a, st a strong enough heat source from your aircraft that it can still track you. Uh, it does not require the open end of your engine at the back of it, the exhaust, to uh, track the aircraft. Which has huge tactical advantage because now, again, you don't have to get saddled up right behind somebody like the next weapon we'll talk about. Correct. Uh, but instead, you could shoot them coming head on or passing by each other. And then the joint helmet mounted cueing system that you talked about with the AIM-9X with its high off bore sight, now you could almost look across the circle at somebody and shoot them while the two of you are in a Luftberry, if you, you know, in other words, like on opposite sides of a merry-go-round and that missile, if it can look over and see them 90 degrees off, can come off the aircraft and turn the corner and go over and attack that aircraft. Yeah, absolutely. And you're making the missile do all the work as opposed to you and your airplane trying to tactically figure out a way to get behind the aircraft right. uh, and shoot them with a gun. Yeah. So does that negate BFM? I mean, are we done teaching dogfighting then? And Never. No, okay. Never. Um, <laughs> that I don't think that skill will probably ever really go away. I think it's just that aircraft is capable, you know, and I'm speaking in generalities, but that aircraft is capable of a certain type of BFM. Whatever that strength is, let's do that. Uh, but you're also taking, obviously, consideration into what the adversary aircraft is, and that's why we learn about other aircraft. But relatively speaking, if you can make the weapon do the work for you, then why not let the weapon do the work? Sure. All right. So obviously some strengths and weaknesses here on this one. We've already touched on it. It's very capable and it's resistant to any type of electronic attack or, you know, real cluttered electromagnetic environments, but it has more trouble possibly with some of the IR stuff we talked about, including we didn't really talk about flares, but yep. there are IR decoys that aircraft can put out and Absolutely. Try to mess it up. Uh, what are some other strengths and weaknesses for the Sidewinder? As technology increases, you're going to find that the ability to employ uh, these weapons also uh, incrementally increases. So as far as time really is probably a strength of it. Uh, but simultaneously, as time happens, we're trying to strengthen our weapons adversaries are trying to find ways to defeat them and and it's typically a lot easier to defeat weapons than it seems like it is to actually use them to win so uh it really just comes down to uh time i think is is both a strength and a weakness right. simultaneously well it's the classic arms race and it literally is right i mean you have a weapon that comes out and someone says uh oh how do we defeat this and they come up with a flare let's say and they're like, yep. oh, okay well then we need to make this have anti-flare technology Absolutely. oh well then we'll create a forward firing flare yep oh okay well then we'll so yeah it's it's literally an arms race and Absolutely. we are to the point where we are and the aim9x is i would argue a very capable weapon i didn't get to shoot one i did shoot a nine mic at a flare that was dropped and I hate to admit it, but I'm 0 for 2 because that one didn't guide either. So I've seen a trend here. But did you ever get a chance to shoot a name nine? I did not get a nine, Mike. Okay. My uh, my test sortie was canceled due to weather oh, uh, with the clouds. That's you know a huge detractor from being able to to employ an IR based weapon because clouds produce IR energy when yeah. the sun's reflecting off of it, just like the ground and the water and everything else. So. Mm -hmm. You know, yet another weakness, you have more environmental considerations with right. an IR weapon than you do with a radar weapon. And again, in the situation where if you shoot it, you may or may not hit your buddy, but, you know, he's in trouble from somebody behind him. You're hoping that the cueing that you're getting feedback on via audio tones is, in fact, who you want it to be. And we have methods in the heads-up display for where the seeker head position indicator should be Absolutely. on. But yep. the point I'm trying to make, not very well here, is that, if it sees heat, doesn't care if it's a friendly or a bad guy. It's going to tell you, hey, I see heat. Correct. And if you are not being careful and having good shot validation, like we talked about in episode seven with Grand, then you could end up with a blue on blue because it's just telling you, I see heat. Not, exactly. Not yeah. And, that's, bad guy. and that would be you know one of those situations where if just like a flare, if that's the hottest thing in the world and that's the type of seeker that it has the, and the ability to track is based off of just 
the intensity of that heat, that's the thing it's going to go off of. So that's that was the first thing that defeated the initial set of AMRAM, or sorry, excuse me, uh, Sidewinders, was the flares right. and just the intensity of the heat coming out of the back. It was stronger than the engine exhaust. So boom, that's what it went after. Yeah, because back then it was, hey, more is better. Exactly. And then we realized that, yeah. Yeah. All right, so we've worked our way from beyond visual range or BVR into within visual range or WVR. Now, if we really want to be heroes, and in some cases in the old days, this is all they had, let's move on to the gun. Yeah, so uh, the good old days, uh, as I would like to call them. I think we all grow up as fighter pilots dreaming and, and thinking about the World War II fights that we see on TV or the movies or whatever, and it's just a man, an airplane, and a gun, and out you go against the world. Not quite the way it is now. The gun has actually pretty much become a last resort kind of weapon. However, it's probably the one that requires the most technical skill in terms of controlling your aircraft in relation to another aircraft. And so it's probably one of the things that we train to the most when we do get into the dog fighting arena. In the Air Force, we call it basic fighting maneuvers. And so as an offender, so the guy behind the guy that you're trying to kill, you're looking to get yourself saddled up within the appropriate range there to make the bullets effectively able to penetrate an aircraft's skin. Aircraft aren't inherently heavily armored unless you're an A-10 kind of platform. But for a fighter type of aircraft, you know, relatively speaking, inside of a mile is, is plenty close enough, I think, to uh, be able to employ the gun uh, accurately. The gun we're talking about is the M61A1 Vulcan 20 millimeter Gatling gun which on an F-16, we carry 550 rounds, which equates to approximately five seconds of time with the trigger squeezed. I don't know how many the F-18 had. 578 in okay. the A through D, and I believe the Super Hornet was only around 400. Okay. So sounds like a lot of bullets, but to your point, this thing fires 6,000 rounds a minute. Yeah. So it's 100 rounds a second. So yeah. in your F-16, you have theoretically five seconds of trigger, and that's not a lot when and you're it's... trying to shoot somebody or... Do you guys also train to using it in, on the ground? Um, yeah, so it's an also a strafe weapon, right. so air-to-ground employment for it as well. Uh, it's not an A-10, uh, you know, 30-millimeter uh, gun, so right. we're not going to do the same kind of damage. We don't have the same variety of bullets coming out of the front of it. They're all the same kind. Um, but relatively speaking, yeah, we, you know, train the same way for both. And uh, if you're sitting there holding the trigger down for five straight seconds, that gun's probably seen its last days shooting because it's probably melted. It's going to overheat, yeah. right. This weapon, as I understand, began development in the late 40s, and I think it became operational around, what, somewhere in the 50s? Uh, yeah, that's just about right. So relatively speaking, a gun is a gun. The technology is really specific to the airplane and being able to fit in an airplane, but the baseline framework of the weapon uh, has been around for a long, long time. So in terms of how that airplane and the weapon integrate with each other um, is really the, the uniqueness between the two, but the, the framework of the 20 millimeter Gatling gun is the same. Right. And on the F-18, we do not jettison the spent casings overboard because you probably go right down our intake, and I assume it's the same on the F-16? Same, yeah. It should be the same for both the F-15 and the F-16. And part of it, too, comes to weight and balance. They're expecting all that weight to remain on the airplane, too. Oh, that's um, true. It would throw off the CG of the airplane, center right. of gravity. Okay. And now on an F-18, the gun is actually canted two degrees up so that you don't have to pull quite as much lead on an air-to-air -air target. Uh, what is it for the F-16? Uh, there's no cant on the F-16. The F-15, I believe it's two degrees as okay. well. It might be three uh, since they're primarily an air-to-air -air right. platform for the C models. I can't speak to the E, uh, the Strike Eagles, but uh, I would assume that there's probably uh, more in line with the fuselage just because they are a air-to-ground uh, type of okay. aircraft. Primarily. So if you are behind a target that doesn't want to be shot and he's maneuvering aggressively... Essentially what we're doing here, and I imagine the listener can figure it out, is you can't just point at him and shoot because if he's turning, which is an acceleration, well, then your bullet's going to go behind him. It's like throwing a football to where the receiver is now. And by the time the ball gets there, he'll be yep. somewhere else. So in your case, you have to pull just slightly more lead. But we have display help in the form of the heads-up display that can use the radar to say, okay, I think the aircraft that I'm trying to shoot is – going this fast and pulling this many Gs. So if you put your pipper right here and squeeze the trigger, then it should hit him. Yeah, ac absolutely. And, and obviously, uh, each aircraft was designed by a different manufacturer. So invariably, they're going to have a different display. But the baseline symbology is going to reflect, are they in range? 
Do I have enough lead pulled? So am I pointing my aircraft in front of their aircraft enough? And am I in line with them? So those are the three things that you need to be able to accurately assess and execute a gun's kill or a track or a snap uh, is what the Air Force terminology is there, uh, which I assume is probably similar to the... Yeah, so I was actually going to ask you this because like a tracking shot in my mind is when you're saddled behind the guy, maybe he doesn't even know you're there if you're lucky, but you're just pumping bullets into him. Yeah. But if, if two aircraft are passing by each other... You can still take a gunshot. That's what we would call a snapshot. Do you guys use that? It's the same. Yeah. Okay. So this is really for training more so than anything. Real combat is pretty self-critiquing. <laughs> you either, you either kill feedback. him. Yeah. You either <laughs> kill him or you don't. And so for training purposes, we try to assess either a track or a snap. A track being uh, we want to get so many frames of actual gun footage where bullets are in plane, in range, and in lead enough that we would constitute that as a kill based off of testing that we've done with these bullets against different airplane types. A snap is anything less than what would quantify that number of frames. Okay. And so if you add up a total number of those frames of snaps, that would equal a kill or a track, if okay. you want to call it that. So a scenario of that might be, and forgive me, but I have to use the Top Gun movie a lot because I assume most of my listeners have viewed it. Sure. But at at the end, uh, what is it, Hollywood or somebody gets, you see a couple bullets go down the side of his F-14. And so you can almost imagine that was maybe from a snapshot. Absolutely. Because it's not very dense. It's kind of just as passing, you know, like almost if you were sitting with a garden hose, splashing a, a car driving by or something. Absolutely. Just, gonna, just a quick, sp- right. s- quick splash of bullets. Right. Per okay. Se. But in training, to your point, if we, you get enough of those, we can give credit for, okay, if you solve plane of motion, range, and lead, everything you need for ballistic bullets that are, once they leave your gun, just flying according to physics, then if you've done everything you can, then we'll give the guy credit. Now, in the F-18, we have a batter, bullets at target range. It's a little circle that shows up on the target aircraft about the time your bullets would in real life. Correct. Providing you, so you guys have the same? Very, very okay. similar concept. I think it's maybe a slightly different display, but yeah, the, in the end, as long as we have a radar lock, mm-hmm. and that's, I think, the next part of this discussion, as long as there's a radar lock that can assess range, you can get one of those. Okay. If you don't have a radar lock, then there's some other uh, visual cues that you can use to assess distance. But uh, yeah, with a radar lock, the, the batter would be the thing that would as long as you see the certain number of frames. And we speak to frames from a, a bygone era of uh, eight millimeter tapes or older, depending on how old uh, you were flying the F-16. Three quarter inch tapes uh, is what I started quarters, with. whatever. <laughs> so yeah, all those things are, are there. That's what I started out with. And we have eventually moved to a digital tape, but you're still counting time because each frame right. equals one sixtieth of a second. So as long as you have a certain number of frames, then you can still assess those shots accurately. It almost becomes a mathematical exercise because Correct. the radar provides the range. We know the firing rates, uh, hence the travel of the bullet. Yep. And as long as we have time, then we can do the calculus and exactly figure it right. out. Okay. Yep, exactly. And the good thing about the batter, to your point earlier, is in real life, you either see impacts and possible damage or explosion or whatever, just like anyone who's watched, which I'm sure most of our listeners have, World War II footage or elsewhere. You, you, you see instant results. Actually, But yeah. in our case... Real time, a little bit, but mostly in the debrief, you can come back and say, oh, look, your batter cue is on the guy, so that's a valid shot, or it's off to the side, so here's what you can do next time to correct that. And exactly sure right. Exactly right. Shots. Yeah, and a lot of this, again, this is trainingisms In the real world, you're still going to get the same symbology, but you're also going to have probably tracer bullets that you're going to be able to see and help assess where those bullets are going, just like you saw in those World War II films. Very cool. Now... In training also, we can once in a while, and I only did it once in my entire career, have a tow aircraft that will pull a banner, and we can fly a particular pattern over, of course, uninhabited areas like the ocean, generally, and we can go out and shoot at that banner with live bullets. Do you ever get a chance to do that? No, I've never done it myself, but it it certainly seems like a lot of fun for the guy shooting. I don't know about the guy that's towing the banner. (laughs) Well, I'll have to see if I can get my former CO on here because uh, Bill Sizemore was CO of VFA 86 when we had a chance to do it. And we didn't shoot it off, which was good. We always said aim a little aft of the the, the tow point at the front of the cable on well behind the aircraft, about 1,000 feet behind. And we had different colored bullets. They had painted them somehow. And so when he came back and dropped it off on a flyby, and then when everyone landed and they went out and hauled the thing in, we were able to count our hits. And 
I want to say I had like 10 hits or something out of several hundred bullets, <laughs> which here I am gloating about. It doesn't sound very great, but it's not easy. I mean, no, I, I can't tough. imagine it would be easy. It's, it's hard enough to hit an airplane that's not purposely trying to evade your bullets, and now you add in that person wants to survive. It makes it infinitely more challenging. Well, and that takes us back to all these other weapons we already talked about, because if we do our jobs correctly out at range, hopefully we don't have to use the gun, but we do have it. And you will continue in your F-35, but I guess I won't in mine. So sure. here we go, yep. back to that thing. There you go. Okay, excellent. All right, so that is actually pretty much it already for air-to-air weapons for U.S. forces. What do you know, or what should we talk about for other weapons? I mean, really, they're all kind of derivations of the same thing. You've got radar, you've got radar homing, you've got IR, and you've got bullets. I mean, yeah. what more is there? We talked about the U.S.-created weapons, Europe has obviously a number of air forces that produce their own weapons on their own and with help from other countries, mm-hmm. um, kind of like the Typhoon being a, a coalition-type right. aircraft. Some countries pair up and try to make their own versions of weapons. Uh, so they all have the same types of conceptual weapons. They just go about executing them differently. So sure. uh, there's an ASRAM, uh, which is a uh, short-range air-to-air missile. You okay. know? Um, there's a MICA IR, which is an IR type of missile, just like the Sidewinder. Uh, the Israelis uh, have a Python family of, of missiles. I believe the last one I can remember is a Python 5, uh, which is a very, very, very capable missile. Of all places, South Africa, you wouldn't think really? as having amazing weapons coming out of South Africa because they don't really produce any of their own airplanes. But man, they, they do some amazing work with infrared missiles. And then they fly uh, Saab Gripens. And then the two big named countries that you would anticipate, Russia, China, sure, uh, and then India is kind of in there in the mix uh, as well. Right. Pakistan, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, there's there's plenty of weapons out there. Uh, we talked about arms races and all that kind of stuff, but yeah, there are plenty of missiles. But really, as far as air to air is concerned, it's radar or IR. Sure. And to your point again, using analogies, I love analogies. You know, Ferrari and Lamborghini. I mean, they're both making sports cars and supercars, but they go about it slightly differently and. Some have strengths and weaknesses. The others don't. But for the most Absolutely. part, they're, they're pretty much the same. Absolutely. Okay. Very cool. When it comes right down to it, we have those three primary weapons in the U.S. and then the gun. And, I mean, gosh, it's been a long time since something new has come out. Is there anything new in the pipeline? I mean, I don't know of anything. That doesn't mean there's not. I'm trying to think. I mean, outside of, like, going the direction of science uh, fiction, you know, and laser weapons and all that kind of stuff, right. there's not really a whole lot in terms of new that I am privy to that realistically is going to show up in the general public's uh, purview. You know, the AIM-120 is going through its upgrades and iterations. We're on the uh, the D variant right now. The AIM-9X is the most recent IR missile the U.S. has, and that goes through its block upgrades. So just like computers and, and aircraft go through their own upgrades, each of those is going through its own upgrade phase as well. And so until you get major hardware changes, you're not really changing the letter identifier associated with those weapons. It's right. just going to be a block upgrade or a software upgrade, that kind of thing. So to that point, at the top, you talked about maybe the first AMRAM, the AIM-120A, was a lot like the, I think you said, Apple IIe. Correct. Well, so now the AIM-120D is probably like that MacBook Pro Air, blah, blah, blah. I can't even Sure, yeah, it, some so. kind of fancy <laughs> computer someplace. Right. Um, and just like anything that's designed, realize it was designed off a set of requirements from years previous. Right. And so... You know, let's. I don't have the exact timeline of when the initial set of requirements for the AIM-120D came out, but let's say it's 2005. It's just now being fielded, right. you know, and it's 13 years later. So there is a lag time. It's just like the F-35 development phase, the F-22, and so on. Well, more so than any other industry, in military, you can't just put out a new iPhone and sell it to the masses. I mean, you've got to test everything in hot weather and cold weather, electromagnetic environments. Yeah, there's so many different things that go into it. Absolutely. By the time something is actually fielded, well, yeah, to your point, it's a decade's ago sure. technology. And, sure. Yeah, just like... But it's still you know, the best we can get because it's going to take another decade to get today's stuff out there. Absolutely. And, and obviously, the more you change after the fact, the more expensive it gets. And so, you know, what would have been maybe an initial purchase price of $50,000 for the first generation of Sidewinder missiles is now over $1 million per missile for the AIM-9X. Every time you squeeze a trigger. Every time you squeeze a trigger, yeah. That's correct. And that includes test missiles and all those things too. So how many do you produce? And And so on that note, we didn't really talk about CATAMs, captive missiles. There's really no need to carry 
captive AIM-120s and sparrows because you can fool, if you will, the jet into showing you what it needs. Uh, but we do typically carry dummy sidewinders, mm-hmm. and that's so that we can put the real seeker in there Correct. and then train to that. Yeah, so CADMs, captive air training missiles, are basically what you see on aircraft that are doing training missions every day. And those are not only simulating uh, the weapons capability, but they're also simulating what it feels like to carry the weapons as well, because there are performance degradations that happen when you carry a concrete missile or any type of missile that's 300 pounds on your wing, whether it be the wingtip or somewhere else along the way. Mm -hmm. They want that realism of training all the time. Uh, and so that's why those things exist and why they're sitting on the wingtips uh, or on somewhere on the wings, just like practice bombs and so right. on and so forth. So with respect to the AIM-120 and the AIM-7, like you said, well, there's nothing going on. Uh, it's just a piece of concrete hanging on the wing. When it comes to the AIM-9, however, the system can't accurately replicate an infrared track because there is no other sensor on the aircraft to do that. Right. So they're going to use the actual AIM-9. The computer has software in it that when you input the training mode for an AIM-120 or an AIM-7, it has all that same symbology. It has all the same countdown timers and everything that you would see if you actually had one that you shot. Uh, the AIM-9, it needs an actual seeker out there to track the thing so you can get the correct tones and find uh, the right target and right. Dis- discriminate that way. And then in the aircraft itself, in training, we can box a sim mode for simulation. It should mirror what you would get in real life if you did have the actual weapon and employ it. So Correct. Yeah. So you know they show in the movies uh, Iron Eagle. Uh, being an Air Force guy, I've got to represent here a little bit. Sure but, thing. You know, there's the master arm switch, right? So you go to master arm. If you had real weapons on it and you went to lock somebody up with the radar and you hit the button, if you had a real weapon, it's going to go shoot that thing. Well, there's a simulate mode of that same switch, which allows you to have all the same symbology on your HUD and sounds that you hear and everything that goes along with that weapon employment uh, so that you get the realism of training when you're in the uh, training environment. Did you guys ever deal with this, though, in the F-16? So um, I don't know if you ever did like what we would call a self-escort strike, but even if I'm carrying blue practice bombs and I'm fighting my way into a target, I still have to come out of sim to employ my bombs because they're still falling off the airplane. So the whole, like you just said, master arm thing and boxing sim and not, boy, that has bit many a pilots because if you get it out of sync, it becomes very easy to screw that up. I think you're probably the only person that's ever screwed that up. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) No, so really the only thing, at least for the F-16 HUD, that can tell you whether you're in a simulate mode or an arm mode, meaning that your master arm is ready to drop weapons or shoot weapons, is a little teeny three-letter word that says arm or sim in the bottom corner of your HUD. And if you're not paying attention, yeah, sure, you're just going to hit that button and it's going to look great, but nothing's coming off your airplane and nothing counts. Well, and conversely, I don't know about you guys, but I know there's plenty of stories in the Navy of two guys out flying around and maybe they're somewhere where they need live weapons. And for whatever reason, they're hassling and one of them calls Fox 2, and lo and behold, off comes a real missile. So that can be <laughs> a problem, too. Not too much these days, but it seems like in the old days you, you'd hear about that. Oh, yeah, sure. And and obviously, you know, the checklists, training rules, everything else are, are built with blood. Oh, yeah. Uh, and those, those are prime examples of that. So, you know, every time something bad happens, they go back, they debrief it like they do and spend some time trying to figure out what the root cause of the problem was. And it could just be as simple as, hey, I had a brain fart and I forgot, yep. or uh, something worse like this is how I was trained and, and now we're going to fix that. True. Well, and I just reminded myself of something I wanted to ask about, and that is the comm brevity. So can you touch very quickly on the different Fox calls, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. So traditionally, you really only hear three. So you got a Fox 1, which is a semi-active radar missile shot. So that's your AIM-7 Sparrow. Right. You're going to hear a Fox 2. Uh, which is your AIM-9 Sidewinder shot, or you're going to hear a FOX-3, which is your radar missile, or your AIM-120. So we use those for com brevity and to uh, inform other people we can make those transmissions on the radio when, in fact, we fire the weapon or simulate firing the weapon. Sure. Okay, excellent. All right, dude. Well, gosh, that's a very broad overview of air-to-air weapons, but I think we touched on the delicacies of this. Anything you think we're missing on this? I don't think so. I yeah. mean, there's there's so many topics you can get into, but a lot of them oh, gosh, just jump yes. into tactics. Yeah, which is, I'd love to talk tactics, but well, it, I, I don't I don't like being in jail. Yeah, that's right. Let's let's. <laughs> uh, okay, 
Excellent. Well, then, shoot, man, let's just wrap this up. And you've listened, so you know we got a couple final questions here. Sure, sure. What's the future hold for you? So I did 12 years active duty. I've now about two and a half or so in the, the reserves. And, you know, family was a, a big portion of my decision to uh, transition over the reserves. So family finally uh, gets to take the lead on this one. My wife's going to grad school. Uh, so we're going to be uh, heading out to uh, northern Colorado and head to grad school for her. And I'll help to manage the, the minions uh, around the household while she focuses on her studies uh, and I try to figure out some other way to be an adult, I guess. <laughs> Not easy for us pilots. No, no, no. All right. Are you going to look for a way to get the final eight years of active duty in a reserve capacity of some sort to keep a retirement? Kind of to be determined. I've got some feelers out there for other uh, options, and who knows? There's there's a lot of lot of cool jobs out there that aren't necessarily in a cockpit. And as you obviously get uh, get older in your career, as you're kind of aware, uh, you don't always get the, the chance to sit there and, and be in the flying club. So... Hopefully we'll get get to, get to do that the rest of the time, but we'll see. I think he just called me old people. I'm not <laughs> sure, but it's never, true. never. <laughs> I embrace it. It's all right. <laughs> all right. So you could theoretically steer your way back into a fighter, maybe you think? Uh, maybe a fighter, may, something else. I mean, it just it really depends on the really the needs of the Air Force and how much uh, moving I want to do. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of the curse of the reserves, but the nice thing about the reserves, you get to be where you want to be, uh, but you have to put up with where you want to be too. True. So. Well, and you have to consider the possibility of deploying. And there's that. You know, exactly two right. young kids at home, that's yep. probably not the top of your list. All right, Boat. Well, we're going to wrap this up, but you know the final question, Boat, huh? So, and that's I don't it. even know this. I didn't barely know you till we met today. That's so right. Tell me about this one. <laughs> I'd love to say that this was some awesome, cool story. Uh, Everybody says that at the beginning. I, Come man, on. I would, I would really love it to be. So I've listened to enough of the podcasts to know that majority of your guests so far have been name-based uh, call signs. There haven't really been too many that have been based off of uh, buffoonery, uh, buffoonerous acts in an aircraft. Uh, so thankfully mine was at least in an aircraft and thankfully it worked out positively. But, uh, in fighter aircraft, uh, you have a radar on the front of your aircraft and in times of poor weather, you, uh, need to sometimes take off and follow your flight lead, uh, out to the training airspace or to combat or wherever the case may be. Uh, and the only way to do that safely is to use a radar, uh, we call that a radar-assisted trail departure. And so uh, the idea being that your flight lead gets airborne and then at a predetermined time uh, and at a predetermined airspeed, uh, you will maintain a predetermined distance from your flight lead uh, so that there's no chance of you running into them, but you're still going to follow them along the way. And then when you do get airborne and your radar is able to be used to follow them, you can lock onto them and follow them out to the airspace. Pretty easy, straightforward. Well, uh, the idea is that if your radar does not lock onto them or it resets or fails or something, you're supposed to tell them what exactly is going on. Well, my third flight at my first operational assignments, I'm in a, relatively speaking, a new airplane to me, uh, and I get enamored with the radar resetting, uh, recycling on its own. Uh, so I'm going through the switches and trying to fix it. We affectionately call it the Viper reset, which means just turn it off and turn it back on and hope for the best. <laughs> and so I'm in the middle of a departure and I'm supposed to be maintaining 350 knots and following my flight lead. And I mean, it's the, probably the most complicated departure you've ever seen, which is just straight off the departure end for 80 miles to get to the training airspace. And uh, subsequently, about three minutes later, uh, I've come to the realization that there's no way I'm ever going to fix this radar and I should probably tell my flight lead that I am blind, meaning I don't see him, and I should at least know that I'm behind him still. I don't see him. And I don't see him because it's a clear blue day. <laughs> there are no clouds in the sky. It's the middle of the daytime, and I have gone from what is supposed to be about two miles behind him to about two miles in front of him. I am accelerating past 450 knots, <laughs> And at some point in the last three minutes of me finagling the computer screen to fix my radar, I passed 200 feet above his aircraft without any knowledge uh, of it whatsoever. So his first inclination was a giant noise and then an all-encompassing eclipse of the sun from my aircraft covering his. <laughs> uh, so for my uh, buffoonery, uh, I was affectionately called boat or blind on assisted trail. I see. <clears throat> so, so it's an acronym. It is an okay. acronym, which I think might be one of the first as well, uh, maybe first or second. But uh, I was 
unfortunately named at the end of my naming ceremony, which was about four hours into a roll call, which everybody was well hydrated. Uh, and the guy preceding me, a good friend of mine, uh, is affectionately called Motor. Uh-huh. And so I'll let you, the fans put uh, two and two together <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Indeed. All right, but well, that is a new one. Yeah, that is always embarrassing when it's a nice day and you have to confess that you're blind. I, uh, touche, because you hit me on something earlier. Uh, yeah, I've never done that, so I think, you're, <laughs> I think you're the only one. Actually, I do remember one time, I, I didn't even look outside. I just said, I'm blind. And the guy just goes, I was the lead. Yeah. And he goes, Look over your right shoulder, and he was like right there in parade <laughs> position. Like, oh, I, I got plenty. <laughs> I got plenty of ribbon uh, over the 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 aux radio. Yeah. Uh, of oh, I know. I'm just waiting for you to tell me. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, because he just went right over him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Excellent. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I had a really good time uh, learning some stuff here on air to air weapons. I hope the listener did as well. And unless you got any parting shots, I think we can wrap this up. No, man, thanks for having me. This was great. Uh, look forward to the rest of the uh, podcast, and uh, hopefully I can help out in the future. Okay, let's get out of here. See you. All right, once again, a big thanks to Boat Trevor Boswell for coming on the show. And he tells me he's got some other Air Force friends he might put me in touch with, so we'll see if we can get some more representation from that service going forward on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Just a couple things I learned about after we recorded the f-15 gun is in fact canted or angled two degrees up from the bore line of the aircraft and the aim 120d was in fact funded in 2006 so his guess was pretty close now we had a whole segment that was recorded but i ended up cutting on the hardware construction of the missile itself and that's because it's pretty straightforward you could look that up on almost any website on air-to-air missiles and you'll find that for the most part you've got some form of seeker in the front whether it's an IR seeker or a radar dish of some sort then you generally will have the brains of it right behind it then either a warhead or the fuse and then the other one and then you'll have maybe some guidance you know fins on the middle in the back and then a big giant rocket motor which is just a solid propellant and for the most part all air-to-air missiles are built the same and of course for the 20 millimeter it is a six barrel cannon and it's in the gatling gun situation there where the barrels rotate and i purposely did not go into all the different electrically operated hydraulically this and that you can look all that up and of course the bullets themselves are also pretty standard with primers and all the different components of the bullet and We also had a bunch of new terms on that discussion. As always, we add those to the glossary on our website. So go check out Batter, BVR, CADM, CG, etc. And you'll find that there. Also, you can take a look on the show notes of this podcast. And we will put some links to various things that we might find, uh, that you might find interesting. All right. I want to give a special shout out here and thank you to our new Patreon strike leaders, Patrick Haley and Scott Morris. They have stepped up, jumped on Patreon, and not only help support this show financially, but they also gain access to exclusive material. So if you want to see what that, all that's about, go over to patreon.com, put in Fighter Pilot Podcast, and you can check out behind the scenes information, unedited interviews like with Boat, and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. I want to remind you that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So that will do it for this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Once again, we'll be back next time with air-to-surface weapons. In the meantime, you take it easy. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and to help support the show, visit our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it.
And then did you guys, I'd never trained to air to surface with a sidewinder, but it was always one of those, I don't know if it was a wives tale or just a thought that people had, but that if you really did get desperate, you could slave the seeker onto a heat source on the ground if you needed to and fire it. Is that something you guys practiced at all? There was no standardized training for anything like that. Um, as I was urban legend, maybe, I mean, relatively speaking. Yeah. In theory, absolutely. In execution, you'd have to be pointed at the ground for a while. You'd have to hope that the seeker can discern between ground and all that right. other, you know, all the other environmental factors. So yeah, possible. Absolutely. Realistic. Maybe. 